Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Um, hopefully this is uh, streaming uh, and hopefully you can hear me. Um, it is unbelievably hot in this particular workshop at the moment. I probably should have checked the weather forecast before this, but uh, you know, I was uh, going to be recapping anyway, so I thought I may as well live stream it. So, uh, Good, I am glad I'm live, and more importantly, how's the sound? Because, boy, that sound has been uh, giving me a little bit of grief of late, so I'm hoping that it's all loud and crystal clear and people aren't having to turn their volumes up and all that sort of stuff. So, uh, so just uh, if anyone gets a chance to just sort of uh, come back and say, sound is good, there we go, and that's from Jay. Uh, so, you know, I, I trust his judgment. Um, Okay, so, uh, and uh, Grudy is here as well, uh, and Steve is here, so hello to the uh, uh, the Maciac guys that joined me here, um, and uh, uh, we've also got Dysfunctional Wombat, um, who uh, has been uh, present at, at a couple of my streams in the past, I think, so um, I will uh, uh, get into this without uh, too much delay, but as I say, this is going to be about recapping Macintosh LC575. So the um, I got I got lots and lots of thumbs up there from Grudy. <laughs> um, so um, so the LC575 is um, not that spectacular a computer, really. I mean, it's a 33 megahertz. 68030 CPU. This is the CPU here. It's the uh, LC version of the CPU, which means that it doesn't have a math coprocessor built in. Um, uh, no, Charlie, you've arrived pretty much just in time. So, um, so yeah. So this is the uh, this is the LC575 board here. Now it has this connector up the top for sliding into the bottom of the computer. And the LC575 was one of the computers with the, it's all in one, but with the larger screen. So instead of like a color classic, it was like pacing a sort of 13 inch monitor on top of the unit. And so it was an all in one. And um, as I say, nothing particularly spectacular about them. But I think the thing that has made them incredibly popular these days is the fact that um, the board is virtually the same size as a uh, color classic, which I, I grabbed one before and I've hit it somewhere. No, oh, it'll turn up later. But anyhow, just as, imagine that I'm showing you a color classic board at the moment and, and it's around the same size. And these will actually slot into the body of a color classic. And that's referred to as the mystic upgrade because the color classic was fairly underpowered. It's a 16 megahertz 68030 CPU. And the, this allows you to really soup it up. Um, you know, you take it up to a 33 megahertz 68040. Interestingly enough, I actually did the uh, Mystic upgrade on my Color Classic just yesterday, and I filmed that, and I will be doing a video, uh, bringing a video out of that in uh, coming weeks. I just have to sort of film the intro and the outro, but the uh, the upgrade is done and was a success. So anyhow, the good old LC575. The cases suffer from a lot of brittle plastic. If you buy one of these online and it gets shipped to you, it'll probably arrive in pieces. Um, but for that reason, what's happened with some of these broken ones is people whip out the boards and then they sell them on their own. That's what I actually did with mine. This one isn't mine. This is a customer's board. But um, so, um, yeah, so they, um, uh, so that, yeah, there are people selling the 575 board by themselves because the rest of the 575 has fallen apart. So, um, as usual with my recapping, um, all of the uh, links to the equipment that I use are down in the description. I have got my LC575 cheat sheet recapping guide. Uh, there's a link to that on my Recapper Mac website. Uh, you can download a PDF if you're wanting to play along at home. Um, so, um, I will, uh, this one has, I think it is 12, 10, 11, 12, 12 capacitors that need replacing. I'm just removing the RAM and the uh, VRAM SIMs. So um, I'll just pop those into a little Ziploc for, so I don't lose them and get them accidentally mixed up with mine. Um, and, uh, uh, and then the next thing we'll do is we'll be taking these old capacitors off, which is a fairly familiar process. You will have all, well, anyone who's watched my videos before 
people have seen me do it before and they know that I use a hot air station. One really good thing about the LC575 is they are a little bit newer than uh, the uh, is sort of a lot of the Macs that I work on most of the time. And for that reason, um, the caps are often not as bad. They're not as leaky. Um, they often come off a lot easier. The solder is usually still fairly shiny. So I don't expect to have any problems with this. I don't expect to need to do any repairs. I think this will just be a straightforward recapping. Um, so let's, I think, uh, let's, let's get rolling so I can uh, flick over here to the microscope view and we'll start up here. Let me just move this thing here. So we've got a nice little sound chip floating here. So sound chip for the uh, LC575, which is the same sound chip on quite a few other computers. I think it's even interchangeable with the, um, the Color Classic from memory, um, but don't quote me on that, but I think so. And then we have two capacitors on the left, and we have two capacitors on the right. So as I've said before, this is one of the reasons why the sound um, is, um, the sound is always one of the first things to go on these because the sound chip lives in this really bad neighborhood on the board where it's surrounded by surface mount electrolytic capacitors, which are very prone to leaking. Um, and if you're wondering why that is the case, uh, it is the main reason is that electrolytic capacitors have a limited lifespan and that just cannot be helped. Um, so uh, what do we got here? I think my LC all-in-one needs the analog board recapped. Which LC all-in-one is that, Steve? Um, monitor gets a bit fuzzy. If it's fuzzy all the time, it might be something you can just do, do with an adjustment. If it's fuzzy only sometimes, it's probably something to do with the analog board needing to be redone. Um, okay. Calif oh, California is watching. Hello to my cousin who is joining into this live stream. Um, and so, hello, John. Thank you for joining um, from here in Australia. I hope the uh, weather's not as stinking hot as it is here. Um, so... Uh, so, all right, well, let's, uh, let's get rolling um, and I will start lifting these capacitors off. So, as usual, I'm going to be using a uh, hot air station. The one that I use is a quick 861DW, but this can be done with a cheapie. Um, it doesn't, I mean, these more expensive ones are definitely better. They're easier to work with, but it's better to use a cheap one than not using one at all. And I'm going to get some of my little heat shields, um, my little sort of metal blades, metal cutter blades uh, with the spring to hold them, uh, hold them upright. And I just place those onto the board in between any, um, you know, sort of any components that I want to protect or in between any plastic, because the plastic, of course, is the main problem. So let's get a little bit of heat onto here and melt that, uh, melt that solder. This little guy, I'm Really should listen to my own advice and get some, uh, get a little spring onto this one to hold it in position. And there we go. All right. All right. So sorry about the view here, but we'll just get these off. And. Oop. And off she comes. Now, I was saying before that these didn't look too bad, but I mean, you will notice that as I lift this away, all that black stuff there is burned uh, electrolyte liquid that has leaked out of the capacitor. And uh, it's so these are very leaky caps, even though they didn't look too bad from the top. So uh, there you go. I mean, if you've got one of these LC575s and it's ticking away nicely and you sort of think to yourself, oh, I don't need to recap it, just have a good old look at that. This is a board that still works, but as you can see, that is um, that is definitely a problem with this one. All right, so let's see if we can get this happening again. All right, so let me just check on the chat. I need to uh, make sure I'm not missing anything here. Uh, um, okay, okay. Yeah, this looks like people are just having a conversation with themselves. That's fine. I'm not going to, not going to get in the way of that. Um, yeah, nobody likes uh, capacitor spooch. That's exactly, exactly right. Um, okay, so let's uh, let's continue and take off these two.
as I've said before, when I have two next to each other, or a group right next to each other, I usually try and remove them together because uh, as you apply heat to the board, the board heats up and makes the removal of the ones nearby easier to do. Um, so there's four that I've taken off the board. Now we've got a couple here that are living right next to the CPU. So for obvious reasons, number one, not wanting to apply too much heat to the CPU and number two, not wanting to melt the C CPU socket. I'm gonna make sure I get plenty of uh, heat shields floating around here, um, which, there we go, I need a nice little one. Uh, okay, if anyone has any questions during this process, please just uh, jump in. I mean, if you've watched mine before, you probably have absolutely no questions at all because I've answered them all before. But uh, I'm always happy to answer the same questions again for any new watchers. Um, this one's a bit of a difficult one because of the angle that I'm coming at. Um, and I may even need to sort of change the direction of the hot air, uh, which will involve, involve moving the uh, microscope while I do it. Yep, I think I'm going to be better off just running the, hair, the air straight down. So I'm afraid I'm just going to have to do this with a microscope just for a moment. So I'll just do this and just watch me point this straight down. Uh, one of the things I don't like about doing this is uh, the microscope gives me a lot of eye protection for obvious reasons. And um, sometimes these capacitors, when you apply heat, ooh, heat to them, they pop like that one just did. And I, uh, I make a, a strange little squealing sound. Um, so this is one of the things that makes me a little wary about doing this without the um the microscope there because they just go poof and you don't want to be getting any of that in your eye so there we go safety tip everyone if you're going to be doing that wear eye protection just like i'm not doing whoopsie all right so then we've got a little throw a little um yes uh yes yeah, steve i heard that happen to you uh sort of uh i said that i think you posted a little video of that they do go pop every now and again um Okay, so, hmm. sorry, needing to stay hydrated because it is so hot down here. Um, uh, it's, yeah, I don't know what the temperature is in here. Outside it's about 34, but 34 degrees Celsius. I don't know what that is in Fahrenheit. Um, but uh, in this uh, shed here with the sun beating down on it and every single device in here generating some sort of heat, it's very hot. All right, so the next thing we have to do is we have to do these capacitors here. And what sucks about these is they're right underneath this plastic uh, connector. And so if I apply heat great to that connector, it will melt. So once again, plenty of uh, heat shields distributed around the place to make sure I don't melt that. Because that's a rookie mistake. All right, let's see if I can do this without having to go point straight down. So I can actually show this on the uh, on the screen there. There we go. All right, so let's just try this and see if we can get these off. Most of the capacitors on this one are 47 microfarad, 16 volts. I think there might be two. Ooh, pop. It's not a bad one, it's in the, under the microscope. I think there's two of the, is it 10 microfarad or something like that? Look, gotta move this up, I don't wanna melt anything. Having a lot of trouble here, sorry about that. I'm just having trouble getting the tweezers where I want them. Up she comes. All right, so there's the three that I really don't like because they're right next to the plastic. And off they go. And only one pop, so that was good. Uh, okay, well, everyone's just uh, entertaining themselves there in, in the uh, in the chat, which is great. Saves me the trouble. I'll just keep chatting away here to myself. So, uh, uh, all right, one more here. Like this one's also in a fairly yucky spot because he's right next to the VRAM Sims. This particular computer has two VRAM SIMs and one RAM SIM. Um, it has four megabytes 
sold it onto the board, four megabytes of RAM, and then uh, I, was, I think there's 72 pin SIMs. You can stick a single 32 megabyte SIM in there, and you can take this up to 36 megabytes of RAM. Now, I've heard that if you get the right sort of RAM, and I'm not sure of the finer details, but if you get the right sort of RAM, you can actually go all the way up to putting a 128 megabyte SIM in here, which will give you 132 with the four that's on board. So when you consider uh, when pe where people are putting these into their Macintosh Color Classics, which had a cap of, built into the ROM of 10 megabytes, to be able to take it up to 132 megabytes really does breathe a little extra life into your, uh, into your Color Classic. So, and if you're wondering why they're referred to as the Mystic Upgrade, it's because the there was going to be a Macintosh Color Classic 3. And the Macintosh Color Classic 3 was going to be virtually the LC575 board, pretty much, in it. Uh, and so they were going to release a 68040 version of the LC575. But it never happened. Uh, it, never, it was never launched, but it was codenamed Mystic. So that's where it came from. So uh, pop goes the capacitor, yep. It's, uh, it's becoming very familiar with this one. I, some of the boards, I don't get a single one. And then this one, I'd say probably, what, 70% of them or something like that, they've popped, which is uh, exciting. Just adds a little bit of extra thrill to your life. Okay. Uh, these ones are a little bit difficult in here because these are, again, tucked around loads of plastic. So even there are, though there are two here, I'm probably going to have to do them separately because I'm going to have to move these heat shields around. Uh, sorry about all the zipping of the board, but it makes sense to move the board rather than move me. Uh, a lot easier for me to move the board than it is to move myself. So, there we go. Okay. Heat, 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 heat. There we go. Ooh okay. So while I'm uh, just doing this stuff, I should just make mention, seeing as this particular person has made mention of my website and my YouTube channel so much in his, I should make mention of Steve, if you, uh, who is also Mac84 there. Do have a look, check out his channel if you haven't, subscribe to it. He has got lots and lots and lots of stuff there about vintage Macs. He's got a whole bunch of Macs. Jeez, I wish I owned. I can tell you that for sure. Um, so, uh, and, uh, so uh, yeah, do jump on there and have a look or subscribe and see all the, some of his videos and, and all that sort of stuff. Uh, okay. This is the last one, I think, by the way. There we go. Off she comes. So. Let's just do a quick little stock take here. Um, I will just go to here and, and show the board and you can see now that there are no more of those little shiny metal garbage bins on there anymore. So, uh, uh, Bruce, mind telling us what your heat shield solution is for the new viewers? Yeah, I made a very quick mention of it before and I, I have to say I really do wish I had one of these cutters so that I could demonstrate it. I might have one in here so just give me two seconds here well maybe more than two seconds here we go i've had one so i can even show people where they come from this here is a cutter as you can see we're all familiar with them you push the blades out if they had a blade in them you push the blades out i think i've actually got some spare ones inside yeah i do so you have these little blades this is what they look like before i leave them out and they get all sort of uh, oxidized and everything but you have these blades and you push them out and you can snap them off the different lengths and that what's really nice about them is that they um, they snap very easily because they're designed to so I basically get these blades and then I just snap them into different lengths so that I can then place them on the board obviously you have to be careful with them because they're sharp but they are um, they're steel which means they just absorb heat really well so I just slot them into the board in between the hot air and the components I'm trying to protect um, and then what I do so that they don't fall over, I just bought on eBay for super cheap, just a box of springs, a whole different type of springs, just different springs. And I have springs like this, which 
uh, like that. And I can then just place this over top of that and rest it down on the board wherever I want to work as a heat shield. Uh, it works incredibly well. Um, I've been very happy with it and I've stuck with that. Now, of course, if if you've got some weird positioning, uh, you know, you've got things in odd places, uh, sometimes you can just use a bit of aluminium foil. You can fold that up and push it into shape. It works quite well, but uh, just, yeah, trying to put anything metal in between the hot air and, uh, and stuff you're trying to protect. So, uh, uh, yeah, sure. favorite 68K Mac. Um, yes, oh, thank you for, uh, for, for tagging me that time, because I do, I, I, I skim over these and uh, and sometimes I, I miss them and I do apologize. So if anyone posts a question and it doesn't get answered, please feel free to post it again. Um, my favorite 68K Mac, I actually have two, I've sort of mentioned this before. Uh, probably one of my favorites is the Macintosh Plus and that's just mainly because of the impact it had on me when I was uh, young, uh, seeing it for the first time and being exposed to a graphic user interface for the first time. And I, that was just the most incredible thing I had ever seen and so, for that, for me as a, I don't know, whatever I would have been, sort of 10, 11 year old or something like that at the time I saw that, um, was pretty pretty amazing. So that that always has a soft spot. Uh, and then probably the next one after that would be the Macintosh 2CI. And that has a lot to do with the fact that I uh, worked in a design studio when I was quite young and they, um, they had 2CIs there. I wasn't allowed to use them. I was just the young, you know, sort of the young guy uh, sort of uh, going around fixing things. But eventually I was able to use them. But uh, they were just the powerhouse. I mean, they were so amazing. They, you know, they just had so much RAM in them and they had these huge screens and they had so much power. So I, I love the 2CI. And I have both of those in my collection now, the uh, 2CI and the, um, and the Mac Plus. But to be honest, I've, I love most of the compact Macs. And I love most of those early modular Macs as well. So 2CI, 2CX, 2, 2X, 2FX. A pigeon just visited me. There is a pigeon right there. Um, I wonder if we're going to turn the camera around. Nope, he flew away. Um, so um, um, I get a lot of pigeons here because I have chickens. And so when you have chickens and you have chicken food, the next thing you know, there are pigeons everywhere, despite all the efforts to try and get rid of them. All right, so I digress. Um, so, uh, just quick look here, uh, first Mac bought with my own money, which, uh, that was the, was that the plus or the 2CI? Um, not allowed to max at all, but, uh, who is your favourite doctor? <laughs> um, uh, I still have it, yeah, uh, plus was the first computer I ever used, I still have it, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 I find that if, once you have one of those in your collection, they're hard to get rid of, I mean, there's just a lot of nostalgia. I, there's a lot of sentimental value with um, with sort of those old Macs for me. So, uh, okay, so I do need a pigeon cam, don't I? Um, all right, so uh, caps off, time for cleaning. So again, we've been through this process before with the uh, viewers that have watched, uh, watched my videos before. Um, I currently have 12 concurrent viewers, so I'm going to do my best to make this interesting. So there'll be uh, impressions and uh, and stuff like that. Um, I might even do a dance. Um, right, so, microscope big. There we go. I'm just going to put some flux on here. Uh, this is Amtec flux. An incredibly important part of soldering in general uh, is to have a good quality flux, and that's because it helps solder do its job. So the job that solder is going to be doing here is it's going to be cleaning up these pads. So I'm actually going to be using some solder and then I'll be removing it. And it might seem that I'm just wasting it, but the uh, this fresh solder just helps to get these pads looking nice and clean. As I do this, you can see that at, when I'm finished, they look like this perfect little kind of lozenge. Um, I mean, these pads really aren't going to take much cleaning at all. As you can see, they look beautiful like that with solder on them. And the next thing I'm going to do is wick that solder away using my uh, solder braid or solder wick. The brand I use is Good Wick. No, they are not paying me. Um, and uh, and then you basically just lay this braid down onto the solder. You place your soldering iron on top. I've got a beveled soldering tip so I can put the flat edge down onto the braid. And you just see that braid get shiny as it sucks up all that solder. And I just keep moving around a little bit here just to clean it up a bit, make sure that those pads 
a squeaky clean. So we're removing solar and we're cleaning up those pads. Now, I gotta tell you, that is an indication of a clean computer. So I'm just getting, I've got some isopropyl alcohol here in this little dispenser and sometimes if it hasn't been used in a little while, the dispenser gets a bit stubborn. So get some uh, isopropyl alcohol here on a uh, cotton bud Q-tip, uh, uh, what a uh, cotton swab, um, and uh, and then just get rid of the flux and any of that burn stuff and any other gunk. Just going to clean that up, so these pads will be perfectly shiny and clean. They'll look like they're new, and they will take the new component really, really easily. So. There we have two clean pads, and I have to say I'm extremely pleased with the way they look. So let's move on to these two. So I did mention before there were mainly 47 micro, microfarad 16 volt capacitors, but there are two 100 microfarad 6.3 volt. So I've mentioned in my, um, in my videos before that there are very common sizes for the Macintosh computers. So um, uh, if you are thinking about doing your own recapping, you really only need to keep a supply of probably four types to be able to recap most of these old logic boards. So, um, and I am planning to put, in the not too distant future, I am planning to put some um, product codes of the ones that I buy because it's very daunting a lot of the time when people go to buy these components and they jump onto Mouser or something like that, and they just go up to capacitors, and they go, okay, right, well, he's told me these are a 47 microfarad 16 volt capacitor, so they put in 47 microfarad 16 volt, and then they go to about like 600 different choices of capacitor to buy. Um, and the sorts of variation you have in those, you can have um, things like the different mounting types, you can have the different types of capacitor, as in, you know, whether they're tantalum or electrolytic or, you know, sort of any other types, um, ceramic, um, and then you can have uh, tolerance, lifetime, manufacturer, uh, dimensions, and there are all these things. Now, obviously, once you get down to the point, you can start selecting different ones of these in isolating, the list will get smaller and smaller. And then, of course, sometimes the way they're sold, you might you might get a particular price and you think, oh, that's a great price. And then you realize you only get that price if you buy 2,000 of them. And that might be a little more than you need. Um, so, yes. Um, so, I to save all that trouble, I am planning to put on the, uh, the product codes of the capacitors that I buy onto my Recap a Mac website. So it's recapamac.com.au for anyone who hasn't been there. Um, it's, uh, and in that it was specifically, it was originally designed to be like a blog of the recapping work that I do, but it just turns out I'm a little bit too lazy to constantly write blog entries. Um, and so I've got a few, well, I've just shared some of the videos that I've done. Uh, but the main thing is there is a, um, a menu item there, resources. And in that, there's a whole list of the computers that I have recapped with high resolution photos of the logic boards and little guides as to what capacitors go where and the polarities of those capacitors. So for anyone who is interested in the, old, the whole recapping thing, um, uh, feel free to jump on and have a look. So more of my uh, flux onto here. I've got three in a row. Again, these are the ones right next to the uh, that um, uh, the connector uh, that from when you slide this board into the computer. And for that reason, I'm coming at this from the bottom rather than the top. So that I, and of course, I've got this PDF slot here as well that I really don't want to melt. Um, but as you can see, these really aren't taking much clean, cleaning. I mean, this, um, this board it looks really good. Um, oh, thank you, thank you, Jay, for posting a link to recap a Mac. Um, so, um, it's all fun and games till you order one millimeter package SMDs. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> you don't want to try and solder those on without a microscope. Um, yeah, I have, uh, I have definitely worked with uh, little tiny weeny 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 little um, little packages, but uh, it's. Um, it's not easy. Um, I certainly wouldn't want to be trying that with like a, a cheap soldering iron and no microscope. 
Um, the mini draft game, but I don't want to do it. I have a bunch of Gateway 2100s that need recapping, and I don't want to do it. Well, I can quite understand that, Grudy. I mean, let's face it, E 2100s. Um, yeah, it's it's if you're not getting joy from it, it's a pretty tedious job. Um, I guess the where it's where it's I think most enjoyable for anyone is when you have a device that doesn't work and you recap it and then after recapping it works and that's where it becomes incredibly rewarding you can sort of say oh wow you know I've uh, this thing didn't work and now it does uh, now I don't know if you spotted it you probably didn't because I don't think I even had the camera on at the time but as I was cleaning this pad here I could see it wheel a little so I'm going to be super careful with that I don't want to lose it uh, often they wiggle a bit when you apply heat to them because the copper is attached to the board using an adhesive and when you apply heat to it that adhesive can soften um, and so this is one of the reasons why it's very good to practice when you are wanting to do recapping if you've never done it before practice on an old board that you don't care about um, and you don't mind about wrecking it so uh, no it's because they're worth like five dollars yeah that's fair enough that's understandable and if there's no real value in them then i can totally understand you don't necessarily want to recap them um, but yeah, I mean, there are. I know I have a couple of computers here that that should be recapped, but they work, and so it's like, well, okay, so it's a working computer. I recap it, and now it's a working computer that's recapped. Um, I just uh, I, I get a lot more joy from recapping the ones that are busted. So, uh, uh, question for those without an ultrasonic cleaner: Have you found a spray solvent that works to dissolve Amtec TF better than ISO? ISO being isopropyl alcohol. I find it somewhat difficult to clean. Uh, tech spray flux remover doesn't work all that well either unless I waste a whole can on it. Yeah, um, well, there are a couple of things. First of all, a lot of the time the fluxes tend to come off a lot easier when they're warm or when they're fresh. If you give them a chance to sort of sit there and kind of bake on and get all really kludgy, they, they, they take quite a bit of removing. Uh, and for that, I generally, if I'm doing that without the ultrasonic cleaner, I usually use a toothbrush with a bit of, uh, bit of, bit of ISO. And the tooth, you know, if you were trying to just do it with a cotton bud or something like that, it would be a nightmare. Um, I'm not the best person to ask that question. And the reason is that I've actually had an ultrasonic cleaner for as long as I've been doing this work. Um, I started on working on modern Macs and then sort of moved to the uh, vintage Macs at a later date. And so I have always had an ultrasonic for as long as I've been doing these, um, uh, these vintage Macs. I even, ha I just, I had a really dirt cheap one that I bought ages ago and it, it kind of did the job, but I couldn't fit the boards in there properly. And then I bought a bigger dirt cheap one. So I, there might be some other people out there, maybe even in the chat that might have some suggestions of getting it clean. But um, because I have always used an ultrasonic cleaner, I, I don't really, you know, explore uh, any, any other methods. So uh, sorry, I can't be more help with that one. Uh, I can't have an iMac G5 with two bulged and two popped and it still works. Yeah, well, um, I, can, I can provide a, uh, a, a prediction into the future of that particular computer, um, but it's good. It, it's lucky that it's still working now. I mean, capacitors can still work when they're sort of bulging. I mean, they can still work, but they won't necessarily work that well. Uh, okay, so, um, yeah, so, all right, I'm going to uh, continue cleaning here. We're getting, we're getting close. I've done one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I've done seven of the 12 uh, cleaning here. So jump across here so we can see that. And again, surrounded by bloody plastic. Um, if you're doing your own board and you do melt the plastic, I mean, at the end of the day, don't lose too much sleep over it. It generally doesn't cause any issue with the board and its functionality. I know it's sort of something you might look at and go, oh, I really wish I hadn't done that. But, you know, once these boards are inside, who's going to know anyway? Um, right. Okay. Oh, the phone's going off. <clears throat> this is uh, someone who tried to phone me on Friday and I fobbed them off because on the middle of the live stream. So... He has now phoned me in the middle of a live stream twice. Now that either means it's just a coincidence or maybe I just live stream a lot, but um, I, um, uh, I will need to explain to him later on why I keep not answering his calls when he calls me. 
Um, all right, so that's another beautiful clean one. I mean, how shiny is that? I mean, that just looks fantastic. Um, all right, two more here. Also surrounded in plastic. Um, another one for the new people here. Uh, if you don't, if I, you can't see what I'm doing. The reason for that is when I look through the microscope, I see an image that's a circle. But what gets caught by the camera is a rectangle from inside that circle. So what gets captured by the camera is far less than what I see. So uh, if I, you know, sort of just lapse concentration and I just look up uh, and I suddenly see that I've been doing all this work uh, and you can't see what I'm doing, I do apologise. Uh, but that's why it's happening. It's not, I'm not doing it blind. It's just not being captured by the camera. Okay. Let's squeeze it. Can I get to this one without melting plastic? There's the question. Yes, I can. All right. Um, so, uh, if you sit down and don't stream a recap, typically how long does it take to recap a board? Good question. Have you seen my fastest recapping in the world video? Um, which probably isn't, but no one else has claimed the title, so I'm claiming it for now until someone else takes it away. Um, it usually takes me about half an hour. It does depend a lot on the board because, I mean, some boards have got five caps on them. Some have got 15. Um, some of them come off and they're clean like this. Some of them come off and you're left with this huge amount of baked on crusty stuff that I have to get, get a scalpel out and start scraping off the pads. So a good quick, easy recap, something like, I think like a Macintosh TV, they've got like five caps on it, something like that. I can't remember exactly, but there's not many. Um, you can do that really, really quickly. I'm talking about the board, not the TV tuner card. That's a nightmare. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, whereas you know, this is 12 capacitors, but it's nice and clean. If I was to just to sit down and do this and not stream, I would say it would take me probably less than half an hour to do. Um, so... Yeah, I mean, in my little speed recapping video, I think it was two minutes and something per cap, but that one required a fair bit of cleaning, so I can definitely do it faster than that. So, um, All right, so getting rid of the old... the old... and oh, old and new sold, um, and leaving lovely clean pads, and then a bit more, I have to trim this off the old... Uh, solder wick it's it's rather wasteful unfortunately because you just it's a one use type thing once it gets smothered in uh in solder you just got to clip the end off and throw it away um but i guess one could look at it and say if we're repairing computers that are going to last longer uh then we're saving the world that way maybe not with these ones because i can't see anyone doing anything particularly productive but if you are repairing things that you would have that you are using and you would have bought a new one if you were unable to repair it. Uh, I think it's a good thing to be repairing them and trying to keep them going as long as possible. Now, I'm going to count these. 16 people and only five likes. <gasps> I know, I know. What's up, people? Um, I'm telling you, Jay needs to be my agent. Um, so... Um, so um pads look freaking amazing i rarely get them that good looking on max just two years old yeah well uh maybe it's the uh, microscope making them look better um so uh, all right so i'm just going to count these very quickly because um i did this the other day oh, <laughs> i didn't even need to count them i found two more i found two more i found two more all right the ones living under the CPU here. Um, so uh, I mentioned earlier on that this one has a 68LC040 CPU. So that's a 68040 CPU that's been sort of scaled back. It doesn't have a floating point unit in it. If you're wondering what a floating point unit is, a uh, floating point unit calculates non integer numbers. So numbers with um, you know decimal place in them. So if you're ever someone that's done any work with databases, you'll know that there is a a file type um, called float, which basically means it's going to have decimal, uh, decimal, you know, decimal numbers in it. So, uh, sorry, yeah, a decimal place in it. I've put some gunk on this here. Um, and so an FPU 
uh, speeds up those calculations of non-integer numbers. And, um, and so, uh, but that also um, uses more power and generates more heat. So some of the computers of, of this vintage used to have the full, uh, the full 68040 chip. Some of them had the scaled back one. This one has the scaled back one. It is a straight swap. You can basically lift off the 68LC040 and drop in a full 68040 to get your, uh, you know, math, your floating point unit uh, built in if you want. Uh, but it will run hotter. So if you're in, using a computer that potentially wasn't designed for one, you might want to think about putting a heat sink on it. So, uh, um, ever repaired a zip drive? No, I haven't. I, to be honest, I've never had one that's broken. I've got, I've got two, but they're the newer um, USB type ones. They're not. I've, I think they're still only 100s, but the USB. They're not the old SCSI ones. I think I might have given all them away. I've got a couple of jazz drives as well, actually. SCSI, SCSI jazz drives, but yeah, I've um, I've I've never had one that's needed repairing, so I've never I've never repaired one. Um, uh, what do we got here? Uh, it's better than they uh, work than end up in landfill. More max in the hands of people and less garbage. Yep. Um, I mean, as I say, with repairs, it's always good if you're keeping something going so that they then people then don't buy something new. Um, you know, I think it's great to be able to just keep things going as long as possible, but. Uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, as you say, I mean, these, if they just sort of ended up in landfill, um, you know, oh, what a waste, all those nasty metals and everything. Um, I'll try with that flux. The flux can solve them maybe enough, especially with freshly tin pads, also extra flux, which remain under components causing issues later. And this is, um, yeah, so there are a couple of things about this, uh, if you're referring to what I'm doing here specifically. Um, the... I use flux uh, and not just the flux in the core of the solar. So for those who were not aware of it, I'm just going to zoom in here. This is some solder. And let me see if I can get this in focus. There is some solder there looking exciting and soldery. I'm going to get a scalpel here and I'm going to slice down the middle of it. Ah, like that. There we go. Now, if I then get some tweezers and, oh God, which has got some goop on it, there we go, and then I open that up, you hopefully will be able to see if I zoom right in here. It's not easy to see because of all that alcohol I just got in it. But there is a core of flux down the middle of that, a core of rosin flux. And the purpose of that flux is to uh, uh, stop the uh, the solder from oxidizing the ox the oxidization or oxidation depending on where you come from is what makes the solder go all kind of filmy and crusty and doesn't flow particularly well um, now the main problem with the flux in the solder is that it is only doing its flux magic at the point that that solder gets melted and then burns away and then it's gone and then it's not working anymore so uh, I use this liquid flux, um, you know, it, it works way better um, when I'm cleaning uh, because as you can see, as I'm doing this, that these are remaining shiny. If I was not using flux for that, they would start to film over a lot quicker. So um, I use flux to make sure that they stay nice and fluid. And in terms of it getting under things, well, I clean these in an ultrasonic cleaner. So then that gets rid of it from uh, under things. So, uh, and when it actually comes time for me to put the capacitors on, the way that I do them, and I don't have to do them this way, I can do them a different way. The way that I do them sort of requires the, uh, the flux to be on there, um, sort of uh, to get the, uh, the pretty joints that I want and the way I do it. And I'll explain that when I actually do it. But um, for, if you are just soldering two things together, um, yeah, don't need, I mean, if, if you're doing like, say, a through hole in particular, uh, if you're just, if, you know, soldering a through hole component, like a capacitor with a through hole, going through the holes, soldering in the two pins on the other side, I don't use flux for that. Just use the flux in the solder, it's fine, it's ample. Um, okay. So, do you have any brand make of liquid flux you would recommend? I, the one I use is one called uh, Amtec. It is Amtec NC559V2TF. There are links to it down in the description. It is uh, a nice flux and it doesn't smell too bad, uh, which is important. It doesn't go too black. It doesn't burn away too quickly. There are 
other ones that I've used that I uh, quite like, but um, to be honest, the price is pretty good on this and the availability, it's, I mean, I just buy it from the States, but there's no one out here in Australia selling it. But I found a company in Australia that was selling a Flux and I bought that and it was okay. It was good to have as a backup. And then I went to go check it the other day and they weren't selling it anymore. So I thought, I'm not gonna bother doing any more research. I'll just use the Amtec from now on. So Amtec it is. Um, so, all right, so I think that's all of them now. And so we're gonna, we're gonna do this again. I'm gonna do it again and we're gonna check the board and count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Okay, that's all of them, all clean. Uh, and for solder, well, I have a link in the description for a particular type of solder. Uh, Kemet, I think. I th oh, is it Kemet or Kemet? I can't remember. It's in the link there. It's in the description. You'll find a link to it. Where I can't. Kem stuff's okay. Um, and uh, the thing is that um, I have to. I buy my solder here in Australia from an Australian retailer. And the one that I buy, it's not, it doesn't seem to be as readily available overseas on somewhere like Amazon. So I've actually put a good quality one there, but it's not necessarily the one I use. But the easiest thing to do if you're looking to buy good quality solder is get one with a, was it 63, was it 60, uh, can't the ratio, 6337. So 63% is it lead and 37% tin. So the 63, generally anyone that is selling 6337 ratio solder is selling a good quality solder. So, and obviously making sure that it's, it's rosin cord and making sure that it's got, um, that it's got flux in it. Um, and, you know, just buy them in a, a big, you know, they sell them in a one pound roll. And they're a bit pricey, but they will last you years, uh, depending on what you're doing. Kester, that's the word, Kester. Um, so, uh, yeah, so as I say, I, I'm not necessarily, um, you know, linked specifically on, I don't have a favorite brand of solder. If you get 6337, you're generally going to end up with good, good quality stuff. And I always use leaded solder, not unleaded solder. Um, and the reason for that is leaded solder melts at a lower temperature and I just find it a lot easier to work with. So, um, you know, I mean, uh, if you want to use unleaded solder, yep, go for it. But uh, for me, sort of um, uh, leaded solder is just much easier to work with. So, excuse me while I hydrate. Mm. It stayed nice and cold there. Nice. All right, so the next step is to put new capacitors on to these lovely clean pads. And that's where my cheat sheet uh, recapping guide comes in handy. And this tells me what goes where. Um, what I will usually do with these, if you've got sort of two or three different types, I put on the ones that like the fewest of, of so there are 10 47 16, and there are two 100 microfarad 6.3 volt. I'm gonna put on the two first. So I'll get those on and then I can just sort of put all the rest on after that without having to concentrate too much about what goes where. For the 47 16 tantrum replacement, do you use size C or D? That's a good question, let's have a look. Let's see what size they are. <clears throat> -na 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 -na. C. How about that? <clears throat> so, right. Let's get. Let's get these little. Uh, excuse me. Uh, 100 microfarad 6.3 volt caps on the board, and we will do that. These are the ones that are up in the corner here. Just switch to that. So these are the ones uh, to the left and that's the sound chip there and they're the two to the left of the sound chip. And so what I was saying before about using flux, this is the way that I do it. Now, you know, and I've talked about this before in, in one of my other streams, um, the way some people would put a component like this on is they would apply some solder to those pads. They would then use hot air station to melt that solder and then drop the component on top of it. Uh, I don't like doing it that way, mainly because these yellow tantalum capacitors go brown when you apply heat to them. They still work, but it just doesn't look very nice. Um, so I like to put a little bit of flux on and then drop my capacitor down like that with the little orange stripe indicating the positive. 
and I plonk that there like that, get it as steady as I can. And now this is the bit where which kind of goes against um, like soldering. Generally, when you're soldering, you want to get the 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 um, the parts hot, and then you melt solder onto the hot parts. That works best that way. That the uh, the, the flux in the solder is doing its job. But the problem I have is um, I um, am I only have two hands, and I want one hand holding the capacitor still, one hand holding the soldering iron, and then I would need a third hand to hold the solder. So what I do is I melt solder onto the soldering iron first. So I've now got a little blob of solder on that soldering iron, and right this very second it is busily oxidizing and getting harder and harder to work with. The longer I keep it there, the worse that solder is getting. But by having the, this nice gel liquid flux here, I can hold that in place there, and when this solder hits the flux, it gets all melty again. And it allows me to do a nice, neat joint like that. And isn't it pretty? Um, so that's why I do it the way I do, with all that flux on there first. Um, and, and I've lost the other capacitor. How many times do I do this? I mean, seriously, I put, I grab two capacitors, or maybe I only grabbed one. I thought I grabbed two though. I grabbed two capacitors, I put them down, all ready for work, and then I look up and the capacitor fairy has stolen the other one that I, br I bring out. I, I swear I have a huge problem with the capacitor fairy in this place. I don't know why why he or she keeps stealing my capacitors away from me. Um, all right, so let's have a look here. Uh, you're keeping me from doing my work here. My apologies, uh, JJ Brubaker, that is that's the problem with a, a live stream. Um, I've been suckered into this myself several times. I um, um, I just uh, talked to uh, talked to Steve Mac eighty four about that one. I have uh, I have lost well eight hours one day, but let's not talk about that again. What are the life expectancy of tantalum caps? Obviously, they are better than electrolytic caps. Um, that's a good question. I don't actually know the exact life expectancy, but it's a lot more than electrolytics. I mean, a lot of these the life expectancy on every on capacitors is generally um, uh, measured on how many hours they will operate running at their peak um, sort of specification. So if you've got a, you know, sort of, uh, you know, whatever the cap, if it's running at its peak of its capability. Uh, they say its lifespan is the amount of hours it can run like that. Now, of course, most of these caps will be actually running well under their spec. So um, working at their lifespan is a little bit harder to do. But one thing I can tell you is that these boards, a lot of these old vintage boards, they have tantalum cap caps put on them by Apple, and none of them are having any problem. Um, only the electrolytic ones need replacing. Um, will they cook someday? They probably will, but I don't know when. Um, we'll see. Maybe there'll be a, you know, the moment we're doing all this work replacing uh, electrolytic capacitors, maybe in uh, a few more decades, we'll all having, be having to replace all the tantalums as well. Might that be fun? Um, okay. Right. Dana. Hello, Dana. Sorry, I look at these. I look at these um, names, and I just go, "Who's that one?" I'm terrible with these sort of names. But uh, uh, right, okay. So I, I I should sort of explain as I was doing this that I I only soldered one side of both of these, and that's because um, I'm right-handed, so the soldering iron comes in from the right-hand side. So I do one side, I flip the board around, and then I solder the other side. Um, okay, so let's get some more solder, um, and put that there, making sure I get plenty of heat on the pad and on the pin of the uh, capacitor, and holding it down with the tweezers so it's nice and flush with the board, there we go. And then we got two nice, neat little joints there as well. So these capacitors are on well now, stuck on solid. And they are the only two of the uh, 100 microfarad 6.3 volt. And 
So uh, now all of the rest on the board are the uh, 47 microfarad uh, 16 volt. So let's start with these three here, surrounded by plastic, the ones that I like the least. Um, get my flux on them. I will focus in a minute. Sorry, folks. There we go, looking a little bit better. I will grab three out of the container, just three. Now, if anyone sees the capacitor ferry take any of these away while I'm not looking, let me know. So I'm going to plonk them on the board. And right. I'm uh, just thinking about the best way to hold this. I wonder if I hold it that way. It might work fairly well. Okay. What do we want to be in focus? Probably the board, not the capacitor writing. Okay. Okay, board looks clean. Yes, it is. this is a really tidy board, this one. Um, I mean, it still had quite a lot of uh, electrolytic leakage, particularly up in the top left-hand corner of the board, but definitely um, definitely a cleaner board than what I'm normally working with. Uh, <clears throat> right, do you worry about anti-static protection when working on the boards, uh, grounded, wrist strap, work pad, etc.? This time of year, I'm probably a little bit cavalier about it. Um, it's not a, it's with it being summer here, it's not a very staticky time of year. Um, I do always touch a bit of metal before I start working on stuff. I've got lots of metal things surrounding me here, a lot of things that are attached to, to the ground, and so I can sort of discharge myself on those before I start. But um, I guess. Um, maybe it's a little bit like, um, you know, sort of a, a big game of Russian roulette. I've never had any problems related to static. I've never damaged anything with static. I've never had anything blow up on me. And, and a, apart from just, you know, grounding myself when I sit down, I don't really do much more than that. And uh, it's that's probably, as I say, a little bit kind of complacent. Um, maybe not the best way to go, but that's just sort of, that's just me. Um, one day I might fry something and then you can all laugh, poke and laugh, point and laugh at me. So, uh, okay. Now we've got first of our 47 microfarad 16 volt capacitors going down. Now this is a little row of three. So one of my main focuses when I'm doing these is to make them look all look like little soldiers lined up. I don't want any of them to be crooked. Um, so I'm always looking at the ones next to them. Um, which you can't see at the moment because it's out of camera, but I can actually see the one above it at the same time. So I am then now going to place this while trying to make sure that it lines up with the one next to it. So that it, when someone has it, because I'll tell you, if you have one crooked, even from a distance, you notice it. All right, there's number two, and then on to number three. Um, <coughs> Grab some solder. Come on, there we go. Hold this one in place. Once again, I'm lining it up with the one above it. Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> now I don't feel so bad. Yeah, I know it's sort of. Uh, you know, some people are very, very, very static conscious, and and look, that's great. I'm I'm not going to I'm not going to try and discourage them from from doing that. Um, but I haven't really had any issues with it. This one's a little bit difficult here because you can see I'm working in a very, very tight spot. Uh, these joints may not be as neat as some of my other ones for that reason. Uh, but just going to solder that on there. It's lovely when it's shiny, isn't it? And then last one. Probably a little bit too much solder there, but I won't tell if you don't. All right, so there I've got my three little three of the uh, the first of the forty sevens down there, uh, and they do at a glance they look straight. So I'm going to now do these ones on the other side of the sound chip up here. Right here. The reason why I have to keep changing focus as I move around this board is because these boards have um, 
little uh, grounding pin thingies that stick out the bottom so that when you slide them into the computer they make contact with the uh, shielding so uh, to ground it and as I sit this on the board sometimes it sort of it doesn't sit straight so um, another 68k MLA member uh, yes I'm definitely a 68k MLA member I'd say there are probably a few of them on here uh, Oh, okay. Boy, oh boy. I'm feeling the heat, heat now. Um, so, I apologise if um, I'm getting a bit sweaty, but it is hot in here. And getting hotter. Okay, so, where was I? I was looking at these capacitors here, or these empty pads here that will soon have capacitors on them. So, on goes the flux. Grab two more capacitors. Right. Now, I'm trying to think of ways of making this more interesting. I'm not sure. I mean, if people want to ask questions or uh, <clears throat> or anything like that, please let me know because um, you know this is just basically doing the same thing over and over and over again. Um, and even with me sort of chatting about what I'm doing, I'm probably it's, it's sure it's getting a little bit boring. So, um, if there's anything you would like me to uh, talk about, I would be happy to, as long as it's not something ridiculous. Okay, hold it in place and get that on there. And you can see all of that having that flux. You know, sort of around the pin there. As I put this, you know, put the solder on it, just always ensures that that join is just lovely and smooth. And you see, I do this in, in two actions. I hold hold the the capacitor from the side, put on solder, and then I push it down from the top and run the uh, iron past the solder again, just to make sure that the uh, capacitor is sitting nice and flush to the board. Um, I'm going to get in and I uh, get to reply to my request for assistance. Okay. I was actually just on 68k MLA this morning. I, um, I'm curious about, uh, someone might know this, but um, there's another Australian. What was it? Was, was it Jason's, Jason's Macintosh Museum? I think it was. He still has the, he's a channel there on YouTube. You can see he basically goes through and talks about a whole bunch of uh, different Macs. And about sort of three years ago, he kind of disappeared. Uh, no more video posts. Um, no more comments on his existing videos. Um, and I don't know if something has happened to him or whether he's just decided that he doesn't want to collect Max anymore or something like that. But um, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a curious one. And if anyone knows why he's not posting anymore, I'd be interested to know. Uh, this one I'm going to have to come at from top down. Um, sorry, because about the lack of microscope, because I just don't have enough room here to do um, to do that join from uh, the side. Let me just check, make sure that it looks all right. It looks okay. That's the one just there in the middle of the camera. It's not one of my prettiest joins, but it will do. Uh, Jason hasn't uploaded in forever. Yeah, I know. I can smell burning plastic. Why can I smell burning plastic? Oh, I see. No, it's all right. Can't see it. Um, Jason has one. Of the, what are some of your favourite classic Mac games? Well, without a doubt, when I fire up an old classic Mac, one of the first things I usually do is, is um, play a game of Civilization. Even if I don't go all the way through it, I start up a game of Sid Meier's Civilization, Civilization One. Um, I love that game, always did. It gives you a bit of an indication of the sort of games that I like, um, you know, more of the strategy based. Um, so I love, I love old uh, Civilization. I love the old original Warcraft and Warcraft 2. I love, um, uh, a couple of others that I generally jump on and play uh, from time to time. But they're probably the main ones. I love the old, um, mist style games now of course you can't you could probably play mist on this one yeah i think you can even do it on an 030 mac but um 
but yeah, I like the old mist style games where you're walking through these three D environments, solving puzzles and stuff like that. So uh, um, I'm I'm a big fan of those. Um, okay. Uh, have you recapped power book displays yet? Um, no. Maybe? Don't think so. I've got a few power books floating around here. They're in the to-do pile. I uh, don't think I have. There was particular ones that needed the displays recapped, wasn't there? Particular models, you'll be able to tell me, I'm sure, um, that they had little uh, surface mount caps in the display and there, there was just some models. I don't think I have any of those models, so I may not have. So, uh, uh, from the get-go, and yeah, it's quite sad. The quality of his content is definitely there. The main thing I like about his content is, I mean, yes, the quality of the content is there. He goes through so much detail of the Macs that he does videos on, but he just had so many of the things. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it was just like all sorts of different, you know, Macs. But anyhow. Um, okay, well, the first time I played Mist was on an LC2. Well, there's an 030 computer, so that sort of definitely settles that. And yes, you can play on a on an O3O, but you do need a CD-ROM. If anyone's wondering what that strange noise was, it's one of my chickens. Um, yep, yep. For some reason, one of my chickens is making a bit of noise. They sometimes do that when there's uh, an intruder or they've just laid an egg um, or they're just bored. So, all right, two more caps on here. I'll just grab these out. Okay, yes, no, I don't think I have recapped any of those uh, PowerBook displays. Um, I actually used to collect a lot of laptops and I just started getting frustrated with them. They have so many problems, um, you know, whether it be, you know, the, the way the, the display gets dark around the edges and stuff like that, or backlights go and, you know, I mean, that. They were just like problem after problem after problem. So I've got a few, uh, and the ones that I have, most of them work. Uh, and I pull them out every now and again and have a play. But um, a lot of those laptops, they were just giving me so much grief that I sort of stopped collecting them and sort of just kept going with the uh, uh, the desktop and the compact Max. Okay, so I say say a lot, a lot, don't I? Sorry about that. Um, here is I say I'm a lot too. I'm on the capacitor having trouble holding this still because I'm in a bit of an awkward angle because of this whatever it is, RAM or VRAM slot. Down. There we go. I managed to get him reasonably straight. Uh, those chickens are up for something. Yeah, I know. There's nobody here but us chickens. Um, okay. I have six of them. And... Needless to say, I haven't had to buy a carton of eggs in a very long time. Okay. All right. Looks like some corrosion to the left of that chip, maybe. You would be, I assume, referring to this via right here, and you'd be exactly right. There is definitely some corrosion bubbling up around that via. Um, it's... I'm pretty sure that's just the ground here, so I wouldn't be too worried about that. Most of the time, um, you know, sort of ground is so kind of thorough. Oh, and there's some nice stuff going on here as well. So let's just have a little scrapey scrape of that just to see what it looks like. Uh, for those who are watching my 2VI video the other day where I found all that corrosion around the video, um, that all got, I cleaned all that up. and. I, there was a, a process that I didn't show in that, you know, maybe just getting a little bit too carried away, but I, I explained that I often do this. I, where I see a bit of black and corrosion, I usually scrape away and I try and reveal fresh copper. I like to reveal nice shiny copper. Let me see if we can come at this a better angle. I like to reveal some shiny copper here. Um, this blade looks like it's getting scungy. I'm just going to have a quick look. Uh, let me have a look. The tips of them get, the tips of the blades get little bits on the air, so there's a little bit snapped off the end of that blade, so I'm going to um, just replace it. Um, 
with from my box of replacements here. Okay, early Mac games like uh, Brickles and Monopoly really are some of my favourites. Uh, games aimed at machines like the Plus are a lot of fun. Yeah, and of course, let's not forget good old um, Shuffle Pack, Shuffle Puck Cafe. I mean, I used to play that for hours. Um, and it is kind of funny that, you know, we have these amazing, we have this incredible gaming technology these days. But, you know, back in the day, I don't know how well people remember the old Nintendo Game and Watch. If you're the same vintage as me, those little sort of little units about that big with a monochrome LCD display, um, and they were a clock and an alarm, but they play, had a little game with a little button on either side. I mean, we'd play those for hours on end, and they were the simplest games you could think of. I mean, they were just there was virtually nothing to them. Things would fall out of the sky, and you had to grab them. And you know, as the game got harder, more things fall out of the sky. You, know, you have to grab more of them. Um, but yeah, I mean, sort of, uh, I just think, you know, um, uh, a lot of those games on those older computers, even though they might seem sort of very simplistic these days, they, there's still some good gameplay to be had. All right, so let's just do this focusing here. And this is me just exposing some of this clean copper. I want to see shiny copper, not that black stuff underneath. And I can even do it here. We can just go in and reveal where all that black stuff was. Now the stuff over here, you might have been mentioning that, that looks largely just like old flux. I don't think that's corrosion there. Uh, so I'm just going to scrape this off. Scrapey scrape. Um, now when I do do a scrapey type reveal thing like that, I have a tendency to... Um, someone's talking to me about repairing a PC. Um, so I'm going to, whoops, I think I picked up the wrong splooge. Yeah, I picked up the white splooge. Sorry. I want this one. This one. I've got this other one, which I'm just sort of trying to get rid of. But So what I'll generally do when I've exposed some copper like this, I will grab some solder and do this and basically tin it. And I'll do that so that it's not then uh, going to corrode in the future. So, um, oh God, that, that flux stinks, man. I don't know what it is. I don't like it. I didn't pay for it. I got given it for free, but I don't like it. Sorry, Amtech. Um, okay. It's one of their other ones, by the way. Amtech make more than one type of flux. So, uh, so then I get I get um, a bit of... Uh, I get my, uh, what do you call this thing, wick? And I go around and I just rub around the surface here so that I've got... I've got this copper, um, which you couldn't see here because it's off camera. This copper is now tinned. It's now got solder on it, so that is now going to uh, be protected. And then once the board's all cleaned, I then paint over that with um, UV solder mask, just in case there aren't any little bits of copper exposed. If you leave just plain copper exposed, that's not coated in something, it will corrode. So, all right. So uh, now I was in the process of soldering on two capacitors. So there's one. Uh, um, right, here we go. right, um, okay, go uh, it looks like um, some of my Mac Yakkers are uh, talking trash to each other, uh, or they might be saying very important things, either way. Um, okay, so we're looking here at I just want to play something like SimCity 2000. Yeah, I, I'm I'm the same. I mean, I, you know, I do I do enjoy playing those old games probably more than I enjoy playing new games to be honest. Because I don't I really don't play games much anymore. Um, so I'm probably more attracted to the nostalgia of the games that I used to play um, than sort of gameplay itself. Um, all right, so there we go. So. I did the other side of these two caps some, such a long time ago, I probably forgot, but there they were. Right, and then I've got, I think, three more to go, so, you know, it's the countdown. Uh, and these two here. Uh, um, this is just above the uh, battery connector, that's the battery connector here. A lot of these LC slide-in boards that came out at the time had a 4.5 volt 
lithium battery attached to it. There's a little black square with uh, like a red stripe on it. And uh, they're very hard to get hold of now and quite expensive now. What I do as a solution to that problem, I'll just change cameras here to show very quickly. Um, I buy these. These are triple A sized three battery holders. So that's it there. You can see it just holds three triple A size battery. Fairly small, neat unit. Two wires coming out of it. Basically uh, put a little plug on the end of that. Ideally, if you've still got the old battery, you can just solder on the plug from the old battery. Um, but it's a fairly straightforward sort of plug there. Even though this has three pins, um, which you can't see because I'm not looking there, but it, even though this has three pins here, uh, zoom out a little bit, that's the three pins. Only two of those pins are used. Uh, the third pin is there merely to uh, ha make sure you have the correct orientation when you, you plug it on there. The plug's got sort of three holes on there and so you can't put it on backwards and accidentally reverse the polarity. So I get these little um, little AAA holders. Now, obviously, if you just put standard alkaline batteries in it, you are playing Russian roulette because those things leak and they're going to leak over the board and they're very bad for you. So if you are going to go down this path, my recommendation would be to splurge a little and buy some lithium AAA batteries. They're super expensive. They will last a lot longer. That's it. Uh, Rayovac uh, batteries, yep. So they will last longer and less likely to then sort of uh, damage the board. So that's the solution that I have for these. It's not a neat one. These don't sit on the board as neatly as those beautiful little 4.5 volt batteries, but it it is a solution. It does work. So... Um, Right, now, uh, where did I get up to? Yep, uh, yep. Uh, interestingly enough, is someone, yeah, it's a dysfunctional wombat saying, all oh, those um, Rayovac batteries, computer batteries, pure evil. Interestingly enough, I've never seen one of those that's exploded. I'm sure they're out, they're out there, but I have seen plenty that are kind of greening around the edges. So, you know, there's probably some nastiness on the way. Um, no flat for some reason end up corroding most of the ground plane over several years. Yeah, I mean, the, obviously the worst ones are the these sort, the little half double A's. You know, I mean, there are just so many dead boards from these. It's um, it's quite upsetting at times. You know, people post people post videos, um, and they might post a video of say I don't know a Macintosh Classic or a Classic Two, and you know, and you just see the state of the of the um of the board from a, an exploded battery, and you kind of look and you think, well. Yeah, I could probably fix that, but then you sort of think, you know, it'd probably take me two hours at the computer, you know, two hours at the soldering iron, soldering iron for that. Classic's probably not worth that. Um, I mean, it, it, it's okay if I'm working on one for myself, but if I'm going to be doing it for someone else and I expect to be paid for that work, um, you know, it's like, yeah, that, I'm not sure that computer's worth keeping. Um, uh, what have we got here? It's uh, probably better than the Maxell death battery bombs. Yeah, the Maxell, I think, have got to be the worst. I don't even know what a Maxell that hasn't exploded looks like. Um, okay, so uh, nice shirt. I just watched the latest episode. Oh, thank you. Yes, Doctor Who fan. Interestingly enough, I'm so far behind on that. I haven't even watched any episodes since he became a she. So um, how about that? Uh, thank you so much for your Krishna Draws. Thank you so much for your Mac videos, Bruce. You gave me the confidence to fully replace all the caps on my Mac SE, analog board, PSU, and logic board. Well done. That's a big job you've been through, and thank you for that. Um, yeah, I mean, going the full the full recap on uh, sort of on an SE or an SE30, you know, that, that's a big job. You know, you've got the analog board, you've got the little power supply, and you've got the uh, logic board. Typically, the SE with its little um, axial capacitors, they they usually don't fail. I would say usually. Um, it doesn't mean they can't fail, but they're usually not the problem. But, um, you know, I mean, I still, with some of those old ones, I still change them because um, they probably will die eventually. Uh, the, <clears throat> and, of course, the SE30, one of the main computers I recap. Most days, if I've got recapping here to be done, I usually have either an SE30 or a Color Classic here. Uh, they're the two most popular um, board recaps that I do. I'm just going to think, come at this at that angle. Um, so, uh, and that's for two reasons. First of all, people like them. They like the SE30 and the Color Classic. 
but it's also because they really need recapping. Um, I mean, the Color Classic is is one that I, when I first saw them, when they very first came out, I was like, oh, I want one. I couldn't justify it. I mean, you know, they were very, very expensive and they had a tiny little screen. They were totally impractical. But I still wanted one. They just, they were so cute. Um, but it wasn't until, you know, years later when I was able to pick one up for, oh, it was a long time ago. I, I can't remember. Somewhere between $100 and $200, I'm not sure. But uh, I bought one and then, so then, yeah, I had uh, I had a Color Classic at last. Okay, there, yeah, there. And then we've got... Okay, let me grab... Jeez, I'm running low on these capacitors. Um, all right, I think this is the last one on the board. So, whoopsie. Well, that scares me when I just click the mouse and I don't realise what I clicked on. Particularly in ABS. I mean, who knows what could happen. Uh, this has been discussed. How did you get your start in Mac Repair? Uh, I started in Mac Repair largely to repair my own Mac. And I can't even remember what it was. I'd, so I... The very first recapping I did was to a Mac, my own Macintosh SE30. I got hold of a Macintosh SE30. I was doing a video. This is years ago, seven, eight years ago, something like that, longer than that possibly. Um, I was doing a video that I was going to post on YouTube of me pulling the SE30 apart. Just doing a teardown video. And halfway through that teardown video, one of the capacitors fell off the SE30, just boom, on the table. So right in the middle of that, that was stopped filming started doing a bit of research and a lot of people saying, yeah, 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 totally normal, it happens. And then I contacted a guy who sold me a little kit of all the capacitors that needed to be replaced. I did my own recapping, it worked, and I was absolutely ecstatic. Uh, then a little bit later on, I started working on modern Macs. Uh, when I say modern, I'm talking about, you know, probably around about somewhere between, I don't know, 20, 2007 and probably 2015, around about that sort of age of computer um, and um, mainly sort of around the 2011 2012 mark and I started uh, buying computers and repairing them and reselling them uh, but then that got really hard because so many people were doing that that people were buying broken computers having a go at repairing them making an absolute meal of them just mauling these things and then selling them again making up stories about this is my laptop and I spilled a drink on it uh, and then you get hold of this Mac and you'd open it up and you think, yeah, right, mate. Um, so, uh, so I was doing a, a bit of that. And as I say, that probably started more out of just, I think I repaired one of my laptops. I had a laptop and I think I repaired it or I bought one that was broken and I repaired it or I got one that was broken and I repaired it. I can't remember exactly. Stumbled across the Lewis Rossman video, learned a few techniques and stuff like that and um, just sort of kept going that way. And then... It came back to the recapping. Um, I then, after I'd bought all of this gear, I went back and had a look at the one that I, the SE30 I recapped years ago and just was so embarrassed at how bad the job was. It was terrible. I had these bodge wires on there and oh, God, it was shocking. So I then uh, went in and re recapped that one. Um, I didn't need some of the bodge wires. I was able to uh, do much, much neater repairs on it this time. And, um, and then... Uh, I then started uh, doing some recapping for other people. So kind of make use of all this gear I have in here. Um, and I quite enjoy doing it. I love working with old Macs. So, I mean, I've had Macs come in here that, are, you know, I mean, I've, I, I've recapped them like a Macintosh TV. I mean, I've, I've, those things are so rare, especially out here, because they were never sold out here, I don't think. Uh, I've worked on, you know, an original 128K Macintosh. Again, they're getting pretty rare these days. So... Uh, yeah, um, all right, so sorry, I'm just going to just check the chat here. Uh, I hope that answers the question about how I got into this. Do you watch YouTube channels like Tech, Tech Moan or Big Clive? Just curious. I do watch some. I don't, um, I don't know Tech Moan or Big Clive, so, but I do watch quite a few YouTube channels. Um, it's not always possible for me to watch all the channels that I want because there aren't, just aren't enough hours in the day. Um, but uh, I do watch, uh, I, I do watch a few, a few, and I do also, I tend to do not much research when I do my own videos. I spin this around this way. Um, whenever I, uh, do it, have a capacitor that has one easy side and one difficult side like this, the easy side is that side on the right, 
The difficult side is on the left where the, the plastic is, so I do the easy side first. Um, but yeah, um, uh, often when I do a video and I think, oh yeah, I'm just going to do this video, this will be great, oh, I'm happy to do that, blah, blah, blah. And then I do the video and then I, I later on realise that there's like about 15 people have done the same thing. A bit stupid really, but you know, maybe it's just pure arrogance, I think I can do them bit better. I don't know. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, I mean, I did a discharging a CRT video relatively recently and um, there are lots of discharging CRT videos out there. So. Um, all right, so this is another one where I'm going to come at this from top down. So we won't be looking at this through the microscope. Um, it'll just be me going down like that without my glasses on, which means I'm kind of just guessing what I'm doing here. Let's see if I got it. I mean, when I say without my glasses on, yes, of course I have my glasses on. I realize I have my glasses on. Yep, that looks good. Oh, you can't see it. I'm just going to microscope, microscope, microscope. Um, you can see that the join there. I, I realize I am wearing glasses, but uh, for close-up work, I need sort of um, different glasses because um, I am, my eyes are getting long-sighted and they've been doing that since about when I turned 40 and uh, I'm not thrilled about it. I used to be able to, I used to be able to see things like about that far away from my face, and now it's sort of like, oh, yeah, what's going on over here? Oh dear, could you read this for me? I can't read it. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Mm. He even watches Mac Yak sometimes. Yes, from time to time I do watch Mac Yak. But boy, oh boy, I tell you what. When I very first appeared on Mac Yak, I thought, I'm, I'm going to do a little bit of research. I'm going to watch a few of these. I couldn't watch many. They're so long. I mean, they're like two and a half hours long. But anyhow, just a reminder to anyone here who hasn't watched Mac, Mac Yak, it's on every Thursday evening US time. It's on uh, Friday uh, lunchtime, Sydney time. And it's uh, a group of great guys that get together and talk about everything Mac. So do jump on to the uh, Mac Yak YouTube channel and subscribe. Um, and you can just uh, listen to us talk, uh, you know, Mac nonsense and solve the problems of the world. Okay, so let's, uh, let's just have a quick look here and do the double checks that I always do. The checks that I do are make sure that the right caps are in the right place. Well, that's fairly easy with this one because they're all 47 uh, microfarad 16 volt except for two which are 100 microfarad 6.3 and they are up here so there i can see my little 107 107 um, and i can see that the stripe here is on the plus side now if you don't see a plus like if it's been rubbed off the screen print uh, like i think in this instance this one here it has been rubbed off the screen print if you can't see the plus another way of knowing which is the plus side did you see these little corners are flattened? So these side, that side there is, that's pointy, and that's flattened. Flattened, pointy. And the flattened side is the plus side. So, uh, so I can see that the polarity is correct, the capacitors are correct. I give them a little bit of a nudge a lot of the time with my tweezers to make sure they hold it held on nice and strong. So um, then onto these ones, nudge 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 again all of these ones will now be 47 just checking to make sure that the stripe is on the plus side uh, a couple over here stripe is on the plus side nudge nudge stripe is on the plus side nudge nudge it's looking a little bit nasty around here because of that uh, corrosion that i have there but that that uh, will come up looking nice when i'm finished with it 47 47 nudge nudge plus plus nudge nudge wink wink okay 47, 47, plus, nudge, nudge. And then our three in a row here, all 47s. There we go, plus, 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 nudge, nudge. Okay, so that looks to me like we have them all in place. So, uh, uh, and Bruce is one of those great guys too. Ah, uh, thank you, yes, yes. And uh, so, uh, generally, uh, the, all of the ones that are mods on my channel, they're the Macchiac guys. And I'm glad too, because I wouldn't have a clue how to mod a channel. It's not my thing. They can do it for me. I like it. All right, so let's jump across to just me. Now, one of the things I have found when I do these recaps is that even if it's a bit of a hassle, people like me to test them. 
So I'm going to test this one. Um, now, 475 VRAM. Don't think it has any on board, which means you can't test it without putting some VRAM on it. It does have four megabytes of RAM on board. That's the chips here, the, all these ones that all look the same. And the VRAM goes here in these two slots there. You can put either, I think it's two by 256s or two by 512s. And the amount of VRAM you put in it says the amount of colors you can display. Again, this would normally only be seen at 640 by 480 uh, pixels. So not a particularly high resolution display, just like your VGA display. Um, and I think you can display in either 256 colors, thousands or millions. Uh, if you have two 512 sims in there, I think, VRAM sims, I think you can get up to, to millions of colors. I could be wrong with that, but I think that's the case. Uh, otherwise, you only get 256 or thousands of colors. Um, so, uh, so let's, uh, let's put this RAM in. Let's t I'll tilt this down a little bit so we can at least see the board and my fat gut. Okay. All right, so these are the VRAM sims here. Uh, four little chips along there. And it's funny, these are, this is really curious. Uh, I've got a lot of these VRAM sims and almost all of them have pencil on one of the chips saying something along the lines of A7 or something like that. And these ones are no exception. So these aren't even my sims. I don't think they're my sims. And they have this little pencil A7 written on them as well. So was some poor little sap writing A7 on every single one of these that came out of the factory? I don't know. Anyhow. All right, so VRAM in. It's so weird, isn't it? Two VRAM sims, one RAM sim. What were they thinking? Um, so. Uh, uh, uh. And one of the things we always uh, talk about here is that Apple had a, uh, you know, I guess a sort of a, a strategy with these. Um, they wanted to come in at all different levels. They wanted to have, um, you know, entry level stuff and they wanted to have pro stuff and all that sort of, all sort of stuff going on. And so they were deliberately limiting certain computers so that they wouldn't compete with their pro level. Now, this wasn't a pro level. This would have been about middle, the, four, the 575, about mid-range. Uh, this was probably aimed at small businesses and maybe home users, um, uh, but it was sort of a step above some of the other ones that they had. Um, probably still reasonably entry level, but um, but yeah. Th so this is why this one would only have one RAM slot and you know a, a relatively small limit to the amount of RAM you could install. Uh, eight megabyte ought to be enough for anybody. Yeah, that's right. And famous last words, other famous last words. Yeah, um, it's. Yeah, I mean, when we talk about RAM today, and this is something we discussed on MacYak just recently, is, of course, that given how bloated a lot of software has come these days, and even just the experience of uh, browsing the web these days eats up so much memory, uh, you know, we just get more and more RAM and more and more and more and more. Um, I remember in the back in the good old days when I used to work in a design studio, we used to go to such incredible lengths to... Um, make it so that we weren't sending big files across the network and stuff like that. I mean, we just go to unbelievable lengths. You know, you would create a low-res image and you would put all your high-res images on a server and you would just pass all the low-res images around and then when you would just go to print it, it would just pull the high-res image off the server. Um, and that was uh, that was just the way we do things, but you just wouldn't bother anymore. I mean, you just send the high-res images around. And people got massive hard drives, got fast networks, there's just no need. Right, now... You might notice that this is not an LC575, and that's because I don't have one. I don't actually have one. I've got a 580, but I don't have a 575. This is actually a Macintosh Color Classic, which you might notice there is actually labeled a Performant 250, because it was back in the days when Apple used to release the same computer with five different names. It's part of a marketing trick. If you were buying a Performer, it might have been called a Performer to be in a, a group of computers that were all called Performer. So they would have the same computer, but they would release it with a different name. And that was, as I say, part of this marketing strategy. Maybe with the performer you got, I don't know, maybe a little bit extra RAM than the standard one, or maybe you got uh, a set of disks or some additional software with it. 
Um, you know, they were sort of a marketing summit, you know, like family users and some of the education market, that sort of thing. And so they had these things with different names. That's one of the reasons why the name is on a little removable little removable little patch. Um, the One of the main reasons why it's on a removable patch is because they called it the Colour Classic and different parts of the world spell colour differently. And so they needed to make it so that little, that little plate could be removed and have colour with a U and colour without a U depending on where they were going to be selling the computer. <coughs> okay, so um, I've been stringing this test along enough. Now, normally you would not be able to run this in a Color Classic. The Color Classic would just get upset because this is spitting out a 640 by 480 uh, signal and this screen is 512 by 384. Um, but this has had a 640 by 480 BGA mod done to it, which I did yesterday, filmed it, Look out for the video coming soon. Um, so this has been modified to 640 by 480. So I will be able to run this board in this color classic. So in she goes, slider into the back, nice and easy. It's one of the great things about these computers that the boards are so easy to remove, not least of which it means it's easy to change the battery. And when you consider things like the old Macintosh classics that had um, Torx screws holding them together, People who own them, people who bought classics, weren't the sort of people to tamper with the inside of their computers. So the battery stayed in there, they went flat, they went leaky, they blew up, they destroyed the inside of the computer. When you've got something like uh, a computer like this, where it's actually relatively easy to remove the board and change the battery, it's fantastic. It's a good thing. <coughs> um, all right. So the design of the Color Classic is something like nothing else. It has so much personality compared to the SE30. Yeah, one of the things I do like about it are the little feet. I don't know why, but these little round feet at the front, I think are kind of cute. Uh, another little mod that I've made to this one that might interest some people, this is for people who like drive activity lights. I like drive activity lights. A lot of people are like, what do I need a drive activity light for? Well, I like them. These don't have a drive activity light. So what I've done is I've wired up a little LED, the red one that sits just above this green one. So when the drive is spinning, this flashes red. <coughs> so there you have it. Let's get some power here. Uh, 240 volts of power because we're in Australia. This is power supply will switch between whatever power you put into it. So let's plug it in. Now, power switch on the back. And here's the little, here's the question. Here's the trivia question. Why doesn't it switch on when I switch on the power switch? Ugh. Need a keyboard. Just grabbing a keyboard at the moment. Okay, grabbing my keyboard. This is the keyboard that I've got here. Um, the particular vintage. I'm going to grab one of these Mises as well. Drop it to the ground. There we go. All right, good old soft power. Need keyboard. Yeah, that's exactly right. You can't start these up without a keyboard connected. I think it gets a lot of people too. You see people um, selling them going, oh, I've switched it on, doesn't work. You know, um, just selling it as it is, not realizing that it might actually work. They just haven't switched it on with the, the, um, the power button on the keyboard. So that's the keyboard there, and that's the power button there. And I'm going to press that power button now, and, and we'll see what happens. Um, the speaker is on the left-hand side here. I won't be able to get the mic close to it, but never mind. Okay. Are we ready? Yeah, I think you probably waited long enough. Well, I hope you heard that. That's a nice chime. That's a very nice chime. <clears throat> These do take a little while for the image to come on the screen, by the way, so I'm not particularly nervous just yet. Uh, oh, look at that. Welcome to Macintosh. Um, that flicker is because of the refresh rate on the screen, but it's not too bad on this camera, actually. Sometimes they flicker like you wouldn't believe. Uh, your clock is set. Yeah, I know. I, I expected the clock would not be set to the right time. So there's me. I had uh, Fetch open. I'm trying to do this. Oh wow, I'm doing this with slight delay because I'm watching on OBS, which is about a half a second slower. There we go. All right, so there's the, um, that's, it says performer, I realize that. But if I go up here to about this Macintosh, 
which I'm going to do now while I have a slug of uh, my drink here. You can see it, it thinks it's a 575, even though it's in a color closet. So just bear with me a second while I drink. Oh yeah, thirsty that time. Right, so, um, you can't really see because it's so bright, but what that says is, um, if this only has eight, eight megs of RAM, total eight megs of RAM, which means that that SIM that I put in was only a four, because it already has four on board. Um, I, um, I might sort of talk to the owner of this board and see if they want me to put some bigger RAM in it. Actually, no, what am I talking about? They've got way more stuff than I have. They've probably got heaps of RAM. Um, so, uh, yeah, because obviously with this, you know, you would want to have at least a 32 in it to take you up to 36 megs. Uh, if you're running system 7.1 like I am here, I think you need to have mode 32 installed so that it will recognize more than 8 megabytes. Uh, geez, it would be good if that was whiskey, I'll tell you what. But you know, I've got commitments. Uh, it's two, 10 past 2 here, and it is now about 36 degrees outside, which means in here it is even hotter. Um, so, um, yeah, and, and for anyone there, it's in Fahrenheit. I've got no idea what that is, but it's hot. It's over 100, I think. So, um, all right. So, oh, did, it, did people get to see the little drive light flashing? I don't know. Um, I'll restart just so you can see it, because I'm very proud of it restart. Can you see it flickering red? You may or may not be able to see it flickering red. Uh, flicker. Flicker! See it flickering red? Hey, there's my little drive activity light. This has a SCSI 2 SD in it. Uh, it has a... I'll tip this up a little bit so I don't need to keep looking down. It has a uh, version 5.0 uh, SCSI 2 SD, which is one of my favourites. The main reason why I like it so much is it's it's a great size. It's the same width as a as a five and a half, uh, three and a half inch hard drive, and two of the screw holes are in the same position. So you can just generally attach these. You know, maybe with some standoffs and a couple of screws. You can just attach them to the same brackets that are uh, that all these computers have, and it's just a tiny little unit. You just whack your little um SCSI to SD, your little SD card in it, and it's all your system. It's, they're fantastic. I really like them. So uh, <coughs> Adobe Type Manager. We didn't have a lot, whole lot of choice back in the day. Um, this is something, here's a little bit of a history lesson for everyone, but very early on when Macs were in the, uh, they got into the design game, um, particularly with System 6, System 7 kind of resolved this, but um, fonts were available with two parts. There was a, what was called a screen font and a printer font, screen and printer font. I think that was, geez, it's such a long time ago now, I've forgotten. Uh, and the uh, the printer font contained all of the high resolution vector information. It contained all of the stuff that made sure that those fonts could be drawn at any resolution and remain sharp because they're all made up of kind of vectors and, and you know kind of mathematical you know calculations rather than pixels. Then you had a screen font which had all the pixels, and so the screen font was used to see the font on the computer screen. Very fast to load. But the problem was you needed a screen font for every single font size you wanted to use. So if it was 10 point, 12 point, 40 point, 18 point, whatever, you needed to have um, a screen font for every single size. And then ATM came along, Adobe Type Manager. And it was a tool that you could install on your computer that would actually look at the printer font and generate a smooth version of the font on screen using that uh, vector information. And it did it quite quick. I mean, it's still slow, but it did it quite quick. And it meant that you didn't need all these screen fonts loaded up for different font sizes. You could have the font display at any size you want, and it would come out sharp and smooth. And so for a long time, Adobe Type Manager was an absolutely essential item until in later on when you know Apple started adopting true type fonts and they started, they built in the uh, sort of rendering tools for smoothing um, type one fonts. Um, them, themselves, and then you didn't need Adobe Type Manager anymore. anymore. But even then, uh, you still needed Adobe Type Manager, I think, in System 7 if you were using Type 1 fonts, which of course most people were, because they'd invested huge amounts of money in buying Type 1 fonts. You used to buy them, you'd get them in a, a really fancy little case with like one font on the disc, and they cost a fortune. So um, that's back in, back in the olden days, the old person like me. 
Uh, okay, so um, can't say like over the years because of ATM. Did I think what else for font book? Yeah, um, interestingly enough, when if you're talking about font management, I've never used ATM for font management ever. I uh, only ever used uh, suitcase. Uh, I used suitcase from about version two, I think, onwards, right up into its uh, OS ten, and I still use suitcase now. I quite like it as a font management tool. Uh, isn't Mode 32 for non 32 bit clean ROM Max? You're right, and this one probably isn't because it's an LC 575, isn't it? So, yeah, it probably doesn't need it. So, um, I'm thinking about the older ones. <coughs> so, uh, if I can just use 32 bit addressing if enabled in memory control button. Yes, that's right. So, uh, uh, yeah, you, you are exactly right. You don't actually need uh, the mode 32 installed on this you just need to switch 32-bit um, addressing on in the memory control panel and you might think well why on earth would it not just be switched on and that was because if you're working with old software there was some old software that didn't work well um, with 32-bit uh, addressing so you might need to switch it off just to use a particular app to stop it from crashing and then you would um, change it um, you know sort of switch it back on again um, so uh, I think I probably even have on this computer um, some old uh, sort of uh, desktop publishing software. Uh, let's have a look, I can't quite see this. Oh, nearly lost my microphone. I hope my audio is still here. Testing, testing, one, two, three. Don't step on your own cable, I just did that. Um, oh, okay, I'm just gonna have to put it in my pocket. Oh my goodness, this is so small now. 640 by 480, not good for my eyes. No, I can't do this, it's too small. Um, okay, I, well, I mean, certainly not at that angle anyway. All right, so uh, I am now going to shut this uh, little chappy down like this. Special, special, shut down. But we have basically shown that that recapping was successful. And uh, who can tell me what the next step is? Uh, okay. Okay, got to go tuck in the spawn back in a bit. No problem, Jay. And it's funny, I, I just asked that question, what the next step is. That's the one that he usually answers, so I might have to answer it for him. The next step is ultrasonic cleaning. Oh, uh, oh excuse me, that's heavy. Oh, so off comes the uh, RAM again. Um and because I don't want to put that in the ultrasonic cleaner, nor do I want to put in the CPU. Um, and the main reason for that is that if I'm ultrasonic cleaning, I may as well be cleaning the, uh, the socket as well, the, the uh, CPU socket. So I've now got to remove this. Uh, but I'm going to do something here. I'm actually going to do that because I don't want you to see how I remove it. Um, because uh, people might actually just be like, oh my God, don't remove it like that. That's terrible. But this is the way I remove it. Um, and it's why I'm going to remove it. So, uh, ultrasonic cleaning. Oh, yeah, okay. He said ultrasonic cleaning before he went. So, all right. I've got my ultrasonic cleaner already heated up. So, um, it's basically inside it contains distilled water. And the reason why you use distilled water is because the water out of the tap has lots of little minerals in it, not good for the cleaning. So, you use distilled water, you know, cheap stuff to buy. There's my CPU. There's all the little pins. I put this over here. I've got a little spot here for components I don't want to lose. So it's right there, just in case I ask you where it is later on. Um, so now I've got that there without the CPU in it. So I can, as I put the ultrasonic cleaner, that can help clean all the little, little holes in there. Um, but uh, yeah, so I use distilled water and then I use a detergent. It's just specifically designed to a detergent. And this called Electro with this special Sydney dust on it. Um, this is one that I buy from a local place, but I believe the one that people use in the States is Branson EC liquid. And it's a very specially designed detergent. It's designed to clear away things like flux, things like grime and dirt, but it's specifically designed not to do any damage to the plastics on the board, the coatings on the board, uh, the metals on the board. So it is very, very specifically designed for cleaning printed circuit boards. Um, so, um, oh God, the 68040 fairy, you got me scared now. Yeah. What am I going to do? Uh, you think, yeah. Well, as you know, 
Well, there might be, but I just realised there's a 68030 here that's still here, so there's no 68030 theory. So, um, um, using pliers to remove caps, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I have talked about this before, and it really just comes down to, when it comes to removing caps with pliers, it comes down to, um, I've said this before, it comes down to like a game of Russian roulette. You, um, you might get, you might get 80% of them, 90% of them, maybe 99% of them off the board without doing any damage. But one day, you're going to go to pull a uh, capacitor off and you are going to end up um, yanking off the pad as well. And then all of a sudden you have uh, repairs to do. So I'm just trying to get this microphone thing back. Oh, put it on upside down. A turkey. Um, so, um, yeah, so look, I, do, I don't... You know, if people want to do it that way, that's fine. I mean, it's the same as me talking about the fact that I don't use a grounding strap. You know, I mean, it's like there are probably a lot of people going, oh, you're crazy for not using a grounding strap. And it's the same as me. So you're crazy for removing capacitors with um, with pliers. I guess each their own. Um, it's just something I would never do. Um, I have repaired some boards that have had capacitors removed with pliers where um, someone's had a go at it and they've just you know lifted one off and it's torn a pad and then they thought oh maybe it was just bad luck they did the second one and that tore, tore a pad and at that point they then stopped and sent the board to me um so um all right so worse than any static russian roulette um so all right now um yeah i can't watch people using pliers i just if i see someone doing it i can't watch it because i just end up screaming at the, sc at the screen it's yeah no good um, all right, well, I'm just going to have a quick check over here to have a look at some of the, the stats. I need some stats. Okay, well, I've got 13 concurrent viewers. I think most I had was probably about 16, so I think uh, some of those have dropped off and headed off. Um, I think if my... It's certainly on the uh, east coast of the US. I think it is uh, about uh, 8.22 p.m. Uh, sorry, 10.22 p.m., I think. So uh, for those who are still watching, I do appreciate it. I could probably just keep going. I've got more recapping to do, but I um, I imagine that most of you are probably like, no, I'd like you to stop now, please. I want to go to bed. Um, so I am just going to um, probably wrap this up now. As I say, the board is recapped. You can see it. You can see all the new capacitors on there. Um, in particular, as I said before, I do like the these little ones here. I like them all lining up like little soldiers. Um, and uh, and I'm, I'm very happy with that recapping. We know it works. Uh, it doesn't appear to be any sort of serious damage to the board. So this will then go into the ultrasonic cleaner. I'll generally clean it for about five minutes each side. For really, really grubby ones, I might go a little bit longer. Um, but um, for, um, yeah, for this one, because it's not that bad, all I'm really concerned about getting off is the, the dust and, uh, and the flux. So once that's been in the ultrasonic cleaner, that will come out absolutely spotlessly clean. I then uh, put it into a bath of isopropyl alcohol. Again, I buy my isopropyl alcohol in bulk. I buy uh, five litre um, bottles of this. Um, and uh, it's 99.997% isopropyl alcohol. Um, and it's not particularly expensive when you buy it in this sort of quantity. I mean, it's, you know, it costs a bit for the bottles. I get that. But in, if you talk about the cost per, you know, you know sort of per litre or something like it's it's really not that bad. Then once they have been in the, ultra, the, uh, the isopropyl bath, what that does, that does two things. First of all, it helps to push all the water away, any of the, any of the liquid that is on it from the ultrasonic cleaner. It helps push that out of all the little holes and stuff like that because the alcohol actually displaces the water. So the water gets kind of pushed away and then you're left with the alcohol in place. And the really nice thing about alcohol, of course, is it evaporates at a very low temperature. So it does also speed up the drying process. So once this has then been completely doused in alcohol, I take it out, I let it drip dry for a bit, and then I pop it into a little toaster oven. Now it's quite a good toaster oven and a fairly sizable one, it's just over there. Um, and it's also, uh, it's got a fan in it, so it's sort of like fan forced, so it helps, you know, blow all that hot air around. Um, and uh, I put in there at about 90 degrees Celsius. I apologise for all the Fahrenheit folks, but I'm sure if you jump on a Google, it'll tell you what that is. Um, and, uh, and I leave them in there for about an hour. That's probably overkill. They're probably well dry before then, but I just don't see any harm in letting them sit in there for a little bit longer. Um, 
I don't like to do them too hot because if you do them too hot, you've got the potential of melting these plastic things. And in particular, if anyone is ever working with a really old board, one uh, like of a compact Mac that has the little restart buttons on it, the plastic on those restart buttons melts at a lower temperature than some of these other plastics. Um, just letting you know, um, don't run the temperature too high on uh, if you're drying a, uh, an old compact Mac board with the restart buttons. Uh, so yes, do you let them air dry? No, I don't. I dry them in the um, in the little toaster oven, and they um, and it, it does a great job. And then they basically come out looking virtually brand new, um, and then they're uh, they're ready to go after that. So um, my aspirator got is only seventy percent. Won't be using that. No, but if you look at something like I, I, I'm I'm sure you guys have it over there as well. It's like isocol, like a rubbing alcohol, um, and there is there is obviously alcohol in that. There is a water in that. There's probably perfumes. There's probably something in it to make it taste disgusting, so that kids don't drink it. Um, and so there are quite a few things in like a standard rubbing alcohol or something like that. Some additional things. Um, you really do need to get the 100% um, isopropyl alcohol. Now, if you're buying large quantities, there are plenty of places you can find them. I and even if you just jump on the eBay. That was where I bought, used to buy mine from. I bought them from a place that just sells chemicals on eBay. Um, but if you're in Australia, we have our big hardware chain, Bunnings, and Bunnings even sell little bottles. They sell 1.25 mil and 500 mil bottles of isopropyl alcohol. It's in the same um, section there that you'd find your mineral turpentine and your methylated spirits and stuff like that. So for any Aussies out there who might be looking for some. Um, okay, so... The interesting thing about it is the isopropyl alcohol, when I have it in the little bucket there, it warms up way faster than water does. So like on a day like today when it's stinking hot, when I drop this board in it and I feel the alcohol on my fingers, it's, the alcohol is like really, really warm because it just takes on the, very easily takes on the temperature of what's around it. Um, right, okay, so I think that is pretty much it unless anyone has any other questions. I'll probably wrap it up now because from this, from here on in, it's ultrasonic cleaner and then the, heat, the oven and that's that's... They're slow, boring processes that I can't, you know, uh, you know, it's too long to make people wait for the end of that. So, um, so unless people have any questions, I'll probably wrap this one up now. Um, uh, I'm certainly a lot happier with the way this one has gone than my last one, with all those joyous problems with my audio and video and everything. Um, I just checked these. Uh, I have no idea how to spell. It's isopropyl. So it's here we go. Isopropyl, I-S-O-P-R-O-P-Y-L, isopropyl alcohol. There's your uh, spelling for that. All right. Um, all right, so thank you to everyone who uh, has watched and who has persevered and hung on right to the end here. Uh, and even thank you to the people who stopped watching. Um, and uh, I will see you at the next stream. So bye-bye now. And then, are you sure you want to end your stream? End.